We're going to have three presenters in this uh, first panel, uh, starting with uh, Bruno Tremblay. Um, I will ask and remind the speakers, please do stay within your eight to ten minutes out of respect for other speakers, as well as allowing sufficient time for the discussion. And I know, Bruno, that you're going to set a good example this way. And if, just in case you don't, the IT people actually have been able to link my electronic shocker through the internet. So. Okay, so if you have any questions, like uh, uh, let's let's keep that for the end. But uh, make sure you speak loud and clear because it's hard for me to understand. Okay, so I was asked to talk about like uh, model scenarios, uh, projector projected future CIS extent. So, given the, the title of the workshop with um, a two degree C warming world and a five degree C warming Arctic. I decided like to first like position those numbers in terms of like what RCPs are we talking about here, and then I'll be talking a little bit about like uh, what kind of CIs are we expecting uh, in those RCPs for two set of models, uh, the full set at first, and then uh, a subset that uh, have a trend in CIs extend decline in the summer that is more in line with that of the observation uh, in the last uh, decades. Okay, so this is this is a, a figure showing the global mean temperature from CMIP-5 model for different RCPs from 1900 to 2100. So all I want to say here is that uh, uh, basically, like uh, the target warming here is shown uh, is red, which is the two degree warming. So we're basically at the top end of the 2.5, RCP 2.5, and at the lower end of the RCP 4.5. So this is roughly like uh, the kind of scenarios that we're, we're dealing with here when we're talking about like a 2 degree C warming uh, globally. So this is, what, this is what I'm going to be focusing on about, RCP 2.6 and 4.5. So. We're talking about like a, a, an Arctic warming of uh, five degrees and uh, and uh, basically a global mean warming of two degrees. So it's a, it's in a polar amplification factor of 2.5. So 2.5 here puts us in the middle of the range for polar amplification in terms of like the CMIT-5 simulation. But the point I want to convey here is that the um, the uncertainty is really large. Like the the measure of the polar amplification is really a measure of how much retreated the sea ice will be in the future, and you can see that there's a very very large uh, uncertainty in model projection. So I understand that uh, politician. We should not be talking about the uncertainty to politicians, but I think between ourselves, I think it's still good to remind ourselves that uh, there are quite large uncertainty because of model physics, but also because of um, there's internal variability in the model at long time scale, which leads to this uncertainty. So this is just another way of looking at the same uncertainty. This is the, the percentage of all simulations that, are, that, is, that still have a, a nearly ice-free Arctic at the end of simulation. And even with the RCP 2.6, you still have about 10-15% of the simulation that are ice-free uh, at any given time here, like in the late uh, 21st century. And conversely, like even with the RCP 8.5, you still have about 20% of all simulation uh, that basically still have uh, an ice cover. So again, it gives you an, an idea of like the, the range of uncertainty between the simulations. So if we're looking at we're looking at two extremes here. Like uh, here, I'm looking at like RCP 8.5, like in red, and RCP 2.5 in blue. And what uh, they've done in the, I the IPCC report here is to uh, to give the mean of all model ensemble member that were that had like a, a trend in the last two decades that was similar to the observation. And this is the solid red line here for the RCP 2.5. Uh, and the blue line for the RCP 2.5, and the dotted line here is the uh, is basically the mean of all ensemble member, whether they have a, a realistic late 21st 20th century trend or not. But we can see like the, between the two, like they're they're distinguishable. Like the RCP 2.5, uh, what you have at the end of the simulation at the end of the century is about two and a half million square kilometer 
with some uncertainty around it. Uh, but these are conditions uh, a little bit more retreated in 2012, just to put this uh, in perspective, for the RCP 2.5. And this is what we're basically talking about when we talk about uh, a two degree warming world or uh, a five degree warmer Arctic. So this gives you now the spatial distribution of the sea ice and uh, I ask you to focus only on the white area and the gray area. So this is the RCP 2.6 and the 4.5. So in white is the mean of all ensemble member, and in gray is the mean of those member who have a realistic late 20th century trend in sea ice decline. So you can see that the 2.6, you still maintain a, a very healthy ice cover there at the end of the century, but that the, in the 4.5, in the uh, ensemble mean of all models, you still have quite a bit of ice, but the gray area here shows those models that are believed to be more realistic and basically there's no more ice left. So somewhere between 2.6 and 4.5 there's a very sharp transition in terms of losing your ice cover. So some people might might say well it may not be a very good criteria like to, uh, to use a late 20th century trend as a, a measure of the quality of the model but recently what we've done is that we've looked at uh, we've looked at simulation from a SMIP 5 model of the mid Holocene, when there was again like a, a radiative forcing at the time and a reduced sea ice cover. And the models that showed like better agreement uh, with the uh, paleoclimate data, with very retreated ice pack on the Eurasian coastline 6,000 years ago at the climatic optimum, uh, there are also those who actually show a, a faster retreat of sea ice in the future. So basically, uh, it looks like uh, those models that show a faster retreat are also those models that are in better agreement with uh, the middle scene uh, climatic optimum as per the paleoclimate data. Okay, so somewhere between 2.6 and 4.5, like this is where we're, we're lying with this uh, 2 degree C warming and 5 degree Arctic warming. And we see that there's no more gray in 4.5, a very, very large change. So what's the difference then in the mission scenario between 2.6 and 4.5? Well, in one case, we take action almost immediately and we bring the emission to pre-industrial level uh, by the end of the century, whereas in 4.5 we wait about 30 years before we take action. So somewhere between taking action now and taking action in 50 years, which seems to be too late as per the models, uh, it looks like this is kind of the range that we have to work with in terms of when we need to take action in order to maintain a sea ice cover if we want to do so. And these are the equilibrium CO2 level in the atmosphere for the two scenarios, like 2.6 has an equilibrium CO2 level of 350, whereas the 4.5 is about 550. So somewhere in that range, around 350 or a bit higher, this is what we're talking about here in this uh, workshop. And this is just to show you what the sea ice looks like today, just in case you're wondering. This is like the, this basically like uh, showing today's sea ice extent uh, with a a large retreat on the athletic sector here and a healthy cover on the Pacific sector. But when we look at the concentration, we see a lot of blue here in the Pacific sector. So there's a lot of potential for compaction of the pack ice if the winds were to be in the right direction. So there could still be very large, like a, a loss of sea ice in the Pacific sector, but a large loss in the Atlantic sector is already uh, on its way. Thank you. Okay, so yes, I am going to talk about how the atmosphere fits into this discussion. Is that Bruno's phone? <laughs> and in particular, um, the role of the atmosphere as a trigger for rapid Arctic warming, as a responder to the disappearing ice and snow that we've just heard about from several speakers already today, and also as a connector between the Arctic and mid-latitudes. And I'm going to focus a lot on 2016, this last year, because I think that this year that we're looking at right now um, could be considered a preview to this scenario that we're all talking about with a two degree world and a five degree Arctic. And let me tell you why I think that it's a preview. So you've probably all seen a, a chart like this before. It's been widely publicized. This one happens to be from Climate Central showing the global average uh, monthly temperatures 
over, um, over the year for several of the most recent years. And here we see the first half of 2016 that's basically bumping up against that 1.5 degree warming level that we've been talking about. So I thought it would be really interesting to see what a graph like this would look like for the Arctic, which is what I plotted up yesterday. And this is what we found, or what I found. So I've put on here the five degree centigrade line for the Arctic. These are temperature anomalies for the same years that you just saw for the global average. And what you see is that, again, 2016 is a very unusual year. And we're already way past that five degree centigrade temperature for this past winter. So we know that this year was very unusual around the globe. Um, a lot of very unusual um, things were going on um, around the globe as a whole. And in particular, I'm going to show you some of these um, factors that are going on. And, and as we know, there's a, there was a major El Nino that went on this winter. So we can see that very clearly. These are surface temperature anomalies uh, for the first chunk of 2016. The El Nino clear, clearly shows up there out in the Pacific Ocean off of South America. We also had some other interesting things. We had this warm blob, which got a lot of attention in the press, this unusually warm um, area of water just off of the coast of uh, Western North America. We also had a cold blob out in the uh, Atlantic. Um, and some research has suggested that's related to the extra meltwater off of Greenland. So again, another Arctic connection there. And then you see these crazy colors up over the Arctic and just how very warm it was up there. So the question, uh, or some people have suggested that this very strong El Nino maybe was one of the main reasons why the Arctic has been so warm. Well, I'm not convinced that it is. So here now I'm showing you the behavior of temperatures in the Arctic since the late 1940s. So these are temperature anomalies up until 2016 for the Arctic compared to temperature anomalies for the mid-latitude. So that's 40 to 60 degrees north. And so what you notice is, of course, the Arctic has warmed much faster than the mid-latitudes. And in 2016 here, we've reached a new record Arctic amplification, which Bruno just talked about. So this is this temperature difference, this difference in the warming in mid-latitudes versus the Arctic is this Arctic amplification that he was talking about. Those red arrows there are the recent El Nino years, or the, over the last, since the late 1940s. The biggest arrows there are when we had very strong El Ninos. And you can see that in the past, um, in particular 82 and 97, 98, when we had the last two big El Ninos, you don't really see any indication that it's affecting Arctic amplification. So I also wanted to draw your attention to what's happening to water vapor in the Arctic. So this is um, just for January through June, uh, again back to uh, 1979. And what we see is that 2016 also set a new record for the amount of water, va water vapor in the atmosphere over the Arctic. I think this is a big deal because that water vapor is a very powerful greenhouse gas in the Arctic. So it is contributing to the extra warming that we're seeing up there. And I think it also applies to this discussion of perhaps being able to do something about restoring the ice in the Arctic, because this water vapor is mainly being transported from lower latitudes up to the Arctic. So this, this factor that drives Arctic amplification is going to be a very tough one to mitigate. So why do we care about this Arctic um, warming so fast? Well, here we again, I have just uh, 2016 from January to June, the temperature anomalies looking down on the North Pole here. Again, you can see that the warming is largest, those red colors over the North Pole with lobes extending down over Alaska. We know that was very warm this, this winter. And the reason we care about the fact that this Arctic amplification is happening so fast is that because we know the Arctic is very cold, it's warmer to the south. When we warm the Arctic faster, we're reducing that north-south temperature gradient. And when we reduce that polar temperature gradient, it tends to disrupt the jet stream. Now, if we look at just uh, a couple of examples of what it looks like when the jet stream is um, sort of consolidated, and when we have an example where the Arctic is very cold on the left here, see a, a big pool of cold air over the Arctic. The jet stream shown by those red arrows there tends to be relatively straight um, as it 
travels around the Northern Hemisphere. And in this particular example, which was in January of 2014, where we had a warm Arctic, we saw this cool um, air breaking up into blobs around the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, this is when we had that attack of the polar, polar vortex over North America with this big southward dip in the jet stream and accompanied by this big northward swing or a ridge over the west, which has been contributing to the drought in California. So when the, when the Arctic is very warm, we tend to see this kind of a pattern showing up. And that leads to the kinds of extreme events that we've been observing in the last few years in particular. So let's take a look at some of the extreme events that have occurred this year and how it relates to what's been going on in the Arctic. And this is work that's, that's uh, been done by Judah Cohen at AER. And what he's done is he's going back again, this is just for 2016, looking at the warming that's happened in the atmospheric column of the Arctic. So uh, we have height here now going up into the atmosphere and going through this, these first few months of 2016. And we see there's been these episodes when the Arctic atmosphere has been very warm and it extends well up into the atmosphere. So this is when it affects the jet stream, when we have these uh, very warm episodes. So if we look at the extreme events that have occurred um, in, the last, in these last few months of 2016, they line up, the major ones line up very well with these warm episodes in the Arctic. Um, you can see there's a whole variety of different kinds. There's been um, cold, um, cold extremes, there have been snowstorms, there have been floods. And I wanted to draw your attention to these particular ones here where we had some very unusual melt events happen on the surface of Greenland this year. And they're, they're lined up very well with these warm events in the Arctic. So just as a summary statement, really, I think this is the kind of uh, behavior that we should expect to see more of in the Arctic. We know that Arctic amplification is increasing. All the models tell us that's going to happen. And we see that when we do have these very warm episodes in the Arctic, we also tend to see a variety of extreme events happening around the Northern Hemisphere. And that's it. Great. Thank you very much for sticking to time. Uh, and again, if there's questions for Jen while the next speaker is coming up, uh, we have a moment or two. We have one back here. Jennifer, do you, do you know the radiative forcing associated? You showed a, a graph of water vapor anomalies or actually precipitable water anomalies. Do you know what the radiative forcing associated with those anomalies is at the surface? Jen, could you use a mic? Um, the radiative forcing at the surface? Yeah. I don't have that information off the top of my head. Um, it always tends to be associated with um, uh, anomalous downward long wave radiation. Those pulses of heat tend to be also um, bring moisture with them and you tend to get extra clouds and so you I don't have a, a number for you but um, they do always tend to increase the downward long wave. Okay we're going to now turn to uh, Mojib Latif who's going to talk about ocean circulation. As almost everybody I changed the title in the last second and I have chosen a more catchy or a catchier title uh, the Arctic victim and driver of climate variability, but the focus is on climate variability uh, because uh, I, I do a lot of media work in Germany where I work, and uh, what I realized more and more during the last years is that the public doesn't have a good understanding of climate variability. So they think of global warming uh, just as you know, a gradual increase of temperature and that temperature is going to rise year by year, okay? And one example, I don't know is how it has been here in the United States, but one example uh, of the confusion has been the recent hiatus in global warming, okay? You can't believe, you know, how many interviews I had to give and, you know, defend the hypothesis of global warming, okay? Now, I try to make clear that if you look at the full record, okay, at the full 
instrumental record, you can't miss global warming, okay? But of course, there is variability, and there is also long-term variability, okay? So you see phases, you know, when the temperature is rising very quickly, then you see phases uh, like from 1940 to 1970, you know, which is termed the grand hiatus, you know, where temperature didn't uh, increase, and then we see again an acceleration, and uh, so on. And you see this uh, pattern uh, not only uh, in global average temperature, but you see it uh, basically everywhere, you know. So what we are looking at here is a latitude time diagram, okay? So here we have the southern latitude, here we have the on the top, we have the high northern latitudes, okay? And what is shown is the temperature anomaly zonally averaged uh, around latitude circles, and, and you see, especially in the Arctic, uh, so the high northern latitude that the Arctic is participating in this uh, multi-decadal uh, variability. And if you just plot an index here uh, of the surface air temperature, then you see this very strong multi-decadal variability. And the sad story is that, you know, most of our instrumental data uh, from the Arctic is actually from the most recent period, you know, so Arctic sea ice, for instance, you know, the satellite data is exactly uh, from this last positive phase of what we call the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation or the Atlantic uh, multidecadal variability. And so I think I would like uh, uh, to, to stress that we should be cautious, you know, but just uh, extrapolating, you know, what we have seen during the last few decades, you know, into the future. So I'm pretty sure there will be more variability uh, uh, to, uh, to come uh, during the uh, during this century. And uh, so uh, uh, I, I think we have to find uh, better ways of communicating uh, the, uh, the, the the issue of, of long-term internal variability. So here was another phase, the early. 20th century warming, you know, uh, uh, where we had also a very strong rise in temperature, you know, which didn't continue. But the long-term trend, you know, and I would like to emphasize this again, the long-term trend is very clear, and the IPCC says in its latest report, uh, uh, the human influence on the climate system is clear, full stop, okay? Um, now let me just talk a little about, a little bit uh, about the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation. Um, uh, so here is a time series, this is just the average uh, over the North Atlantic from 0 to 60 North. And if you look at the pattern that goes along with this multidecadal variability, then we see that uh, it is mostly concentrated in the North Atlantic. And uh, someone who works in the field of ocean circulation, you know, uh, uh, or for someone uh, immediately rings a bell if he sees this kind of pattern because uh, the very general overturning circulation in the uh, Atlantic, the uh, you know, has its strongest imprint on surface temperature exactly in the North Atlantic Arctic uh, region. And so, uh, if you look at the trend uh, in Arctic sea ice, we have seen this uh, several times already in, in, in the morning uh, uh, here for winter. You know, then we see that at least in winter uh, we have exactly. Uh, the strong change in uh, Arctic sea ice concentration, the, uh, the strong trend in Arctic sea ice, the declining trend in, in Arctic sea ice concentration, exactly, you know, uh, 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 where uh, the, the influence uh, of the Atlantic multidecadal variability uh, would be felt. Now, I said uh, the Arctic uh, is victim and driver. Okay, and let me come to, to the driving role. All right, so uh, you all know probably, or most of you know the North Atlantic Oscillation, okay? And North Atlantic Oscillation is, is an atmospheric uh, teleconnection pattern, uh, uh, which is the leading mode of internal atmospheric uh, variability over the Northern Hemisphere. And it affects, and you see this on, on the right, uh, uh, deep, the deep convection side uh, in, in the Northwest Atlantic, in the Labrador Sea. And this is a key region of influencing the large-scale ocean circulation that we uh, refer to as the uh, Atlantic uh, Meridional Overturning Circulation. Now, the North Atlantic Oscillation has, uh, 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 you know, it, 
in a way, way it, it has uh, a wide spectrum, okay, but a wide spectrum means that it has also a low frequency variability, okay, and the ocean loves the low frequency variability, so he, uh, the ocean basically responds to the low frequency variations, uh, which you see uh, uh, in, in, in the black curve, you know, which is a low pass filter. And uh, this drives the uh, ocean uh, circulation. Uh, we don't uh, know very much from observations uh, because data just started in 2004 from the rapid uh, array, but we have models, okay? And we can run models, climate models, for thousands of years, you know, to study this long-term internal variability. And uh, to make the long story short, the models actually uh, uh, are very consistent uh, with the rapid uh, what the rapid data show. I don't know if you can see the green curve. The green curve is from the rapid array, and I ju have just chosen one particular segment uh, from the model run, you know, which fits the fast drop uh, in the overturning circulation uh, uh, very nicely. And now, if you if you look at the right, you know, this is uh, the variability of Arctic sea ice, just you know, without any external forcing, just internally produced. And you see the time scale, I hope you can see the time scale, so that's 700 years, okay? And you see exactly uh, the change uh, uh, where we have observed uh, the strongest trends during the most recent decades in winter. So I'm not saying that the trend, you know, is purely natural or purely internal in nature. All I'm saying is that we should apply some caution here by uh, simply interpreting all this trend as anthropogenic. Okay, yeah, basically done. So here are some points uh, you may want uh, uh, to think uh, about. So first of all, uh, the Arctic is victim, okay, but we should not forget that the Arctic also influences the ocean circulation, and by this it can actually influence global climate, okay? So there is a two-way interaction. The Arctic does not uh, only respond, but the Arctic also shapes uh, global climate. So the second point, uh, sources of projection uncertainty. There are three sources. We have heard this uh, uh, or, or, or already. Okay, so uh, model uncertainty, scenario uncertainty, and internal variability. Internal variability is quite a significant source, especially on short time scales. So if we think about you know, the next decades, we can't neglect internal variability. That's probably the major source uh, of the total uncertainty. Then, um, you know, uh, the climate models, you know, uh, simulate very different levels of internal variability. Our model produces a lot of variability. I don't know if, it, if the model is overdoing it or not. All I'm saying is there are models, you know, which produce huge uh, variability. And so we can't simply extrapolate the recent decadal trends into the future. And the last point, uh, which I didn't talk about, but, you know, uh, uh, the overturning circulation, you know, may considerably weaken uh, in response to Greenland ice melt, and this may actually stabilize Arctic sea ice for, you know, uh, uh, some time. Uh, I, I think it's clear that it will eventually uh, go away if we don't act, uh, but uh, I, I think all the CMAP runs that we have seen don't really consider uh, this effect to land ice melt. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much for your presentations. Um, uh, responding directly to Mojib's talk, but maybe everybody could comment if they wish, um, about the most recent uh, hiatus in warming. My understanding was that the, there's a belief that that was due to uh, some misinterpretation of the, of the observed collected data or perhaps error in the collection of the data. I forgot exactly what the issues were, but is there precedent for for changing the the record to account for those uh, those uh, uh, issues to, to to show that there actually wasn't really a hiatus in in the sense that it's being interpreted that way. I, I think there was at least a slowing. Whether there was a halt or a stop in global warming, I, I think uh, this was not really the case. And. Uh, uh, all I can say is, and, and that's also important in, in, uh, you know, uh, to us when, when writing the report, uh, you know, even defining 
the actual state of the Arctic is a difficult issue, okay, because the hiatus, or, or the problem with the hiatus that in the instrumental data was actually in the Arctic, that we may have misinterpreted uh, the data uh, in, in the Arctic because, uh, you know, uh, we have quite some uh, 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 regions where, where we lack uh, data, and the way how you actually interpolate the data, you know, makes, makes, makes quite a difference, you know, to the global average temperature. And so I, I don't know. All I can say is, you know, and maybe all these papers turn out to be wrong. You know, they have a, a huge amount of publications explaining the hiatus. You know, starting with La Nina prevailing La Nina conditions uh, in, in the tropical Pacific. I don't know. I all I can say, uh, uh, you know, we predicted uh, a kind of hiatus in, in 2008, and it shaked off. The, the community. So this was a paper in Nature, okay. And then, uh, you know, about ten years later, there will now be a comment on this in Nature, okay, uh, uh, claiming that there wasn't any hiatus at all, okay. Basically, along the lines uh, what you are saying. So it has not been published yet, but we have been asked uh, to to write a reply, okay. And so, in a couple of months or so, you will see this discussion in Nature. So, I. I wonder if it would be helpful to have a little bit of discussion about how would we define a hiatus instead of letting somebody come along and assert there's a hiatus and then start discussing it. If you just logically said, okay, we're looking at trends over a long period of time, what would a hiatus, what would you have to have to call it a hiatus that might might be a way forward so that we're not um, arguing on different premises? Does that make sense? I would just add to that. Um, yeah, I think one of the ways you could define a hiatus would be to not only look at near surface air temperature, which is really the only variable where the hiatus shows up. If you look at ocean heat content or upper level atmospheric temperatures or a bunch of other things, it's just not there. So, you know, a way to do it might be to not just focus on near surface air temperature because that's hard to measure in some places. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. It was on sea level, right? There, there was no hiatus at all because it basically reflects uh, right. ocean heat content. Can't see it. Oh, yep, right. sorry. Can't see it through the spotlight. I always think it's personal. Yeah, don't I, take it personal. <laughs> There's just that halo you have. So I'm just kidding. Um, I, I had a question to Jennifer. and. Um, well, first I want to uh, emphasize, that, uh, emphasize that it's really uh, uh, this jet stream meandering is a very important issue, and I think you know it's also um, unifying the, the northern hemisphere to a certain extent because you have these extreme events in, in, in Russia, 2010, and, and Pakistan, uh, the flooding at the same time, and, and uh, perhaps the 2003 um, heat wave in, in Europe, and so on. I mean, it's. It, it really is uh, raising awareness to the climate problem of whether this is justified or not. It's a different problem, a uh, different issue, but it's, uh, it raises awareness. Now, what I'm wondering is there is this um, theory that if you have a, a wave number, <coughs> I think, six, seven, and eight, then you get a stagnant uh, situation, and that would be s significant, right? Is this something? I would just want to know what you think about it. It's from our institute, so that's why. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with that work. Um, Komu and um, Kolchukas, I can't remember his first name, anyway, his last name. Um, yeah, and they were looking at summer conditions only. So um, what they found was that um, when the Arctic was very warm, they found that the jet stream tended to split. And when it splits, it tends to create a standing wave. And that stating wave then becomes very persistent, and it leads to those kinds of um, extreme events that you just listed, the summertime flooding in Pakistan, the heat waves in Eurasia, and that sort of thing. So um, that's really, they've been focusing more on the, on the summer application. Peter? Uh, Moshe, the, the biggest uh, signal that you had in terms of hiatus or decline is in the 1950s or whatever. I, it was my understanding that uh, a good part of that could actually have been the loading of the atmosphere with aerosols during the so-called smog build-up phase. Is, if, isn't that, I mean, first of all, is, is that your understanding too? And if so, wouldn't we have to be careful then to, to just uh, 
included if there is an, a, a known cause that leads to reversals or plateauing in, in a trend? Well, I think the jury is still out. Uh, that's one hypothesis that, that is discussed. Uh, there are other uh, papers uh, describing this as internal variability, so a slowing of, of the Atlantic Mercury overturning. Uh, I, I think uh, we actually don't know uh, what the reason is, and uh, in a way it, it's almost a matter of belief. Do you believe in aerosols or do you don't believe in aerosols? So if, if, if you look uh, at the climate models, you know, the variability, the internal variability uh, would be strong enough uh, to explain such a high end, okay? Uh, so uh, there were also papers by Jerry Mule and so on uh, looking at climate models and, and uh, describing that at least the recent hiatus, you know, was nothing special uh, uh, with regard to a variability uh, simulated by climate models. So I, I think you'll find uh, papers from both camps, and I can't tell you know uh, which camp is correct. So we have this gentleman behind Peter, then Franz, then Rafe. I have a question to Jennifer. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> In 2016, you saw um, some sequen sequential extreme events looks like related to some arctic arctic signal yeah isn't it they were coincident okay so for example like um, uh, last march uh, very extreme ssw all the way warming all the way up to stratosphere that looks like uh, related to some north america snow and some storm uh, did you see any special pattern uh, uh, is it is it really related to some uh, SSW event or just uh, some local uh, circulation anomaly? Uh, do right. you have any comment about the yeah. relation? So let me just uh, maybe rephrase that question a little bit because there is a, a pretty well-established theory out there now in the literature that um, warming in the late fall in the Arctic um, connected with sea level, a uh, sea uh, ice loss and so forth, um, can transport wave energy up to the stratosphere, which disrupts the stratospheric vortex, and then that wave energy then transfers back down to the troposphere and um, basically is a memory mechanism to disrupt the jet stream well into the late winter, say February or so. And that um, seems to have happened in 2016. There was a clear um, warming event, several of them in the late fall, um, it appears that that warming, you can see that in that figure, if you were looking for it, um, does seem to translate up into the stratosphere and disrupt the stratospheric vortex. And in fact, um, the vortex had a, uh, the stratospheric warming was at a new world record, according to Judah, um, this 2016. So that mechanism that is also connected to um, extreme cold winters in Asia seems to have been in operation this year. Thank you. Franz? <coughs> yeah, over here. Uh, also for <coughs> Jennifer, um, could, could you hold the mic a little closer? Oh, sorry, yeah, this is also a question for Jennifer. Um, you showed that water vapor record that was kind of yeah. new to me and seems to provide a potentially powerful feedback um, mechanism, and I was wondering if that is um, understood, if uh, people have looked at that retrospectively or, or what we know about that. Right, so yes, um, water vapor has been implicated as one of the main um, contributors to amplifying Arctic warming. It does it through several processes. The one I mentioned was the fact that it's a greenhouse gas all by itself, and in the, especially in the winter in the Arctic when the atmosphere is very dry, if you add a little more water vapor to it, it really increases that downward long wave. But that water vapor also <coughs> creates more clouds. And during the winter time, those clouds are really effective at trapping the heat below them. So the water vapor is a really big deal in the Arctic for, for, for increasing the amount of warming. Rafe and Doug and then the gentleman behind Rafe. Uh, is Mike on? Yes. So I have two questions. Uh, first for both Bruno and Jen. Uh, there's a paper by uh, 
uh, team at, at, at Scripps. Uh, I actually discussed this with the author yesterday on the way here. That suggests that the actual measurement of, if I get this right, of the effect of albedo, the loss of sea ice on the warming in the Arctic, is much larger than the models have. And that, in effect, the albedo is equal to, from the ice alone, not from snow cover, was about 25% of the effect of CO2. And, well, so the question is, is there an underestimation in the models of the actual physics of the uh, albedo loss? That's the first question. Second one for Bruno, if he could go back to his slides, just give us a little bit more on this critical period that we have. Uh, I mean, if I understood it correctly, he was sort of pointing out in the models when you had to act to maintain some level of ice cover. He just went by that very quickly. I'd like to go back, but so I have two questions. I actually think Bruno would probably be a better one to answer the first question too, because he's looked more at the models than I have. So let me start with him. And yeah, go ahead, Bruno. You're muted, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I, I'll, I'll say first what I understood, and then you can correct me. Uh, <laughs> please go through Teresa. Like I, I hear her very clearly. Uh, what you said was like that the albedo, uh, the change in albedo of the surface was just as large of an effect as the increased CO2 on the decrease of sea ice in the Arctic. He said is that correct? 25% of the warming is due to the albedo change in the Arctic. 25% of the CO2 effect. No, the Yeah, and the, and the question is, uh, uh, do I think it's realistic, or what? What's the question? <laughs> you could talk to that mic for Bruno. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. load my presentation so we uh, we know what we're uh, uh, okay so you're, you're referring to this figure I'm, I'm guessing when when we looked at the so, so you're wondering how quickly do we need to act in order to maintain the sea ice is that what, what you're wondering about Okay, so uh, I mean, like the RCP 2.5 suggests we need to act uh, immediately if we want to maintain a sea ice cover uh, in the Arctic, which is, uh, I believe, like at, at equilibrium here, what we get is a is a sea ice cover which is similar to 2007. And in order to do this, we need to act immediately. The RCP 4.5. Uh, Basically, like what you would have is like you would still have some sea ice at the end of the summer, but it would basically be uh, uh, 1.5 million square kilometer, which is what we usually call uh, an ice-free Arctic. So it looks to me that acting in 2050 versus acting now is the difference between a nearly ice-free Arctic with 1.5 million square kilometer to a 
an, an Arctic with a, a sea ice cover at equilibrium of about uh, similar to 2007 as per model in the CIMI-5 archive. I'm directed to this graph. May I add something very small? Uh, uh, sure, okay. go ahead. Um, this is, um, you, you show here um, CO2 emissions, while the RCP are only clearly defined as CO2 concentrations. They are representative concentration pathways. I'm just saying this because it looks as if there's a, like an absolute, uh, ab absolute certainty what RCP 2.6 and RCP uh, 4.5 mean in this world, but it's not, uh, not the case. Um, there's an uncertainty when you translate from concentrations to emissions, and I would assume that uh, this uncertainty alone would smear out the difference between 2.6 and uh, 4.5. I'm just I, that's just a you know a matter of, of being careful here and, and and just a matter of caution. I could just respond to yeah. Ray's first question real quick um, about the yeah. the uh, effect of the albedo of the Arctic and its role in the global. Um, warming. I think you know what we saw in Bruno's um, chart showing the different Arctic amplification factors and the different models. So some of the models probably get it reasonably correct. Some of the higher models potentially. Um, I don't remember exactly what that paper said, but I think there's a real range across the models as to their ability to capture that effect. Doug. Has a take on. You are hesitant. Okay, now I hesitate to fix. Exactly, I kept pressing, turning myself off. Um, it relates to this issue of internal climate variability, actually internal variability in the Earth system, and. I'm wondering, uh, probably mainly from Mojib, but uh, other people, um, as a result of all that fuss over the, the, the so-called hiatus, of course, we discovered holes in our uh, measurement coverage of even basic surface temperature, which is something that we've been studying for decades, and one of, is one of our only global data sets, and yet, as a result of the controversy of the hiatus, we found some, at least, issues which were significant enough to get published in Nature concerning the extrapolation of temperature data into the Arctic. And my feeling went on that was that wasn't that something that we could have or should have anticipated before? I mean, how come it took a massive political controversy to result in the science to identify that perhaps our observing network for something as basic as temperature wasn't very good? And I think there's many examples of that, and also many examples of scientists get locked into arguments about, for example, that there is climate vari internal climate variability, and maybe we need to anticipate it and, and be ready to explain it. So how do we get ahead of the game as a community? And I think the Arctic's a particular area where, of course, we don't even have the benefit of something like Argo uh, in the Arctic at the moment, and so we're projecting change in the ocean. Very few mechanisms to really get a handle on how it is changing, even though we know it is. How do we get ahead of this, Mujib? How do we get ahead of the game so that we're not um, challenged by events which then reveal that we hadn't thought ahead as much as we could have? Is that a possible question to answer? Yep. Um, not fully, but, but at, at least partly. So uh, one thing is uh, we can work on the attribution of past events. Okay, for instance, you asked the question, or you asked the question, right, uh, about the, this grand hiatus. Okay, and I, I think that that's an ideal case uh, for uh, uh, sophisticated uh, attribution study. You know, uh, uh, multi-institutional, or, or maybe can well, you know, uh, come up with a program or, 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 or so. So, and, and that would bring together, you know, observationalists and, and, and modelers and, uh, you know, uh, you know, like during Toga, you know, uh, Tropical Ocean Global Atmosphere, uh, where, where we had also a, a similar group together. That, that's one thing. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, we, I, I, well, I, I can only speak for, for myself. I was so surprised by this 
discussion about the hiatus. I couldn't believe it. You know, I thought it, it's the most natural thing in the world that climate varies, you know, even without any external forcing. Okay, and then I realized that, you know, this is obviously nothing uh, uh, that, that, that is fully acknowledged uh, in, in, in the uh, public, especially by journalists. You know, so uh, they, they co couldn't believe it that, that uh, such a thing uh, can happen. And I, I think, and, and this was how I started off uh, my, my talk, I think we need to think much more about climate communication. I, I think we are just doing climate communication, you know, without any training, you know, so, you know, I, 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 you know, I get a phone call and then I answer, you know, and I'm doing this for 30 years now, okay? And I think most of you guys are uh, in a similar situation, you know, and, and uh, you know, in, in the morning someone said, you know, politicians don't care about uncertainty. Uh, and, uh, but I, I think uh, we, we, we can't accept this. They must care for uncertainty. And how do we communicate uh, this? So, uh, you know, this is what, what I don't know. So I think I had a question back here behind yep. Rafe. Thanks. Uh, Lou Leonard, again, from WWF. Um, my, qu my question was actually quite similar to Rafe's um, second question, uh, but uh, I guess maybe I would just say that it, it seems like this is an important issue for how we are going to frame things tomorrow, perhaps, um, because on the one hand, there's this question about is there a real significance to being on the you know, RCP 2.6 um, you know, uh, uh, trajectory or not, um, is it, you know, is, is do, does the difference between uh, those two scenarios really just smear out when you start moving from concentrations to emissions pathways uh, or not? And, um, and, and then that, uh, you know, if, uh, in, in my mind anyway, and I'd be interested in any reaction from Bruno or others, um, is significant to the question of whether the emissions reductions that we undertake over the next 30 years um, are a part of helping to maintain some of the existing features and functions of the Arctic versus um, really more about some long-term, um, you know, uh, steady state that is, is more about, uh, you know, recreating something that we, that we lose in the mid, uh, you know, part of the century or second half of the century. So I just wanted to sort of underscore that because I think it might come back as we try to figure out how we're going to talk about this stuff um, uh, tomorrow. Great. I, I didn't mean to say that, that uh, you know, there's no difference between RCP 2.6 and 4.5. There's, there's a huge difference. And, and I think uh, the Arctic sea ice is one of the, you know, the um, uh, important systems that show this. Uh, I'm just saying that when you trend, uh, probably temperature is a good, good measure for the Arctic sea ice, uh, then, but there's the problem, and, and Bruno showed this very, very nicely, there's the problem of uh, polar amplification, so it matters where the warming has happened. Um, I just wanted to say that it is not, it, well, you see, it's not, it's, it's not so clear that if we follow 4.2.6, uh, we'll, we'll save the Arctic sea ice, and, and 4.5, we, we don't, um, especially when you go for emissions, when you go on the emission side, because uh, there is significant spread around these two scenarios when you go to the emission, and then when you go to temperature. And um, so, I, I, all I wanted to say was, if you peak in the next five years and go down afterwards and go negative in emissions in 2070, like the RCP 2.6 is saying, uh, that does not guarantee you an Arctic sea ice, for example. You know, something. Peter? Yeah, I, I just, just wanted to, to make a comment that uh, will relate to the later session that we have on possible CO2 modulation and regulation. In one of Bruno's graphs, there was, for RCP 2.6, there was a number for the equivalent CO2 concentration of 350 ppm. You often read a number of around 420, 425. That, that's the CO2 equivalent. So we are now at CO2 concentration of 408. So we, we are actually already in an, in an overshoot, if you, if you will. Uh, and you know, that, that will be addressed then, in, which in essence means we, we have to seriously consider negative emissions. 
and, and that's why we, we have this, uh, this session coming up. Uh, I just wanted to sort of put these protections and the pathways and the concentrations we're attached to Bruno's graph into the context of where we are right now and what we will discuss later on in terms of the possibility of negative emissions. Yes. Yeah, just, just sort of a, a subtle, slight variation on the point that I think we're discussing in the context of how sure can, can we be that an RCP decision will, will, will impact where we end up with sea ice. And we're hearing about the large role of variability, potentially. Um, I think, you know, I think we should also take on the idea that, you know, what, that there's a distinct possibility, arguably, um, as distinct a possibility as this idea that variability could swing back in our favor. I think we also have the possibility that we may have already, um, through underestimating the forcing of Arctic sea ice, set and stage the process where it's not going to matter whether we're on 2.6 or 4.5 because we may have really sort of already uh, already locked in. So it's, it's sort of the same point, but um, focusing less on the variability and more on the idea that we may have underestimated the sensitivity. Okay, well, let's thank uh, our speakers one more time.